Well, good morning, Walden Church. We are deep in our summer series and it is hot. It is hot outside. Uh, so it's nice to be inside, nice to be where it's cool. Last week was Father's Day. And so I hope you all had a pleasant uh, celebration. My family, we didn't do anything. We didn't do anything for Father's Day. We didn't celebrate it at all. And I know every family has their own way of celebrating, you know, maybe uh, dad, dad wants to grill or maybe you let dad go fishing or you let uh, dad play golf or maybe he just wants to sit and watch some sports. I have hobbies. I do. I have hobbies. Sports. Sports has never been one of my hobbies though, uh, but I do, enjoy, I do enjoy going to games. I've, I've gone to several baseball games. I enjoy that. Uh, I've only been to one basketball game in my entire life. And it was back when I lived in Sacramento, California. Uh, it was a Sacramento Kings game. And it was a, it was a really crazy game to be at. Um, it was December 22nd, 1994. <laughs> they were playing the Minnesota Timberwolves. And I honestly don't remember anything about the game. Uh, all I remember is I had to go to the bathroom. So I'm, uh, uh, for the longest time, I'm one of those people that uh, doesn't enjoy missing out. So I hate getting up in the middle of things, like in a movie or a game. And, and I just, I stay there as long as I can. <laughs> but I couldn't wait any longer. And I said, you know what? I have, I have to go to the bathroom. And I, so I started making my way across the, the row, but I, I didn't want to take my eye off of, of what was happening in the game. Basketball moves pretty fast, you know? And when you go to a baseball game, uh, you could look down and tie your shoe and look back up and nothing's different. Like <laughs> nothing changed, right? You could probably even go and buy a hot dog and come back and nothing's changed. Basketball moves pretty fast. So I was in the aisle, going across the aisle, kind of looking back, watching the game, but I had to make this point where I would turn and start making my way towards the exit door. And there was a moment where the entire stadium collectively gasped, just held their breath. And then there was this big, huge eruption, this big, huge cheer, and then the score buzzer. And it was in that instant that I had turned away, that I missed the shot. I missed the shot. It wasn't, it wasn't just the shot. It was a shot. It was insane. It was the shot that they would play over and over and over again on the news that night. And I wanted you to see it. I found the clip just for you. Good defense by Ryder, forcing a tough shot by Richmond. Did not allow him to put it on the floor and get by. destined for the Tonight Show before playing some plans change. They would have known about this shot. They'd have booked him once again. Innocent enough play. Winston Garland about to pass the ball to J.R. Ryder, who started away from the ball, and then this happens. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Isaiah Ryder of the Minnesota Timberwolves made a shot from the line over his shoulder without looking. What did, what did the announcer say? Shot of the decade, right? And I was there. I was at that game. But that's all I can say because the moment happened when I wasn't looking. Both, right? Both Isaiah Ryder and I were not looking when that shot was made. I missed what would later be called the best save no look three pointer ever. So let's go back to Father's Day. <laughs> Father's Day, uh, I was sick. I was sick and I uh, didn't come to church. I wasn't here. And my question is was God? Right? I missed it. 
I wasn't there, but was God there? I, I, all week long, I was supposed to be at Vacation Bible School, and I wasn't there. Was God? Does God show up even when I miss it? I mean, even when I don't show up, does God show up? I mean, if, of course he does. And that's a really easy question to answer. I mean, don't we believe that God is always working? And if that's the case, if God is always working, then what am I doing? Right? Am I missing it? You ever had an entire day go by and you didn't even think about God once? The entire day went by and you didn't think about God once. Didn't pray to God. What about more than a day? Maybe a couple days? You ever gone a week without thinking about God? It's possible, isn't it? Which is sad because we're his people. Other times when we do notice God, like, like maybe it was a really great worship service and you're like, ah, oh, or, or you went to a conference and there was a really great speaker, or maybe you're just, you know, on the edge of some precipice and you're overlooking some beautiful picturesque scene and you just say, and then mm, God showed up. It was, it was such a God moment. And I know, I know what we mean when we say that, but it sounds like you're saying that God made a special guest appearance and that he's not normally there. Let's, let's change the question. When was the last time you saw God show up? When was the last time you saw God work? When was the last time you heard God's voice? Has it been days or weeks, months, years? If it's been a while for you, what can we do about that? I mean, we said earlier, God is always working. We believe that. So he's always speaking, right? He's always moving. So today, this morning, I would just like to collectively pause and say, let's not, let's not miss it. Let's not miss this moment. Let's even be present right now because maybe we fail to hear him sometimes. We fail to see him sometimes or all the time. So maybe we need a little help to recognize God's activity more a little help to hear his voice more so that we don't miss what God is doing all around us. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus feeds the 4,000. Very similar to the story of the 5,000, but there's a couple of subtle differences, and I want to hang out here in Mark chapter 8 for our time together. The chapter begins, In those days when a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples and set before the people. And they set them before the crowd and they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into a boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmathua. So an amazing miracle story, right? To be sure. What, this is one of the big ones, right? Oh, you should have been there, right? You should have been there. You, you missed that moment. Oh, wow. Hey, hey, we're going we're gonna to take some people and we're going to go uh, see Jesus. Oh, man, I got I to gotta stay here and work. You missed it, right? You missed it. Jesus fed 4,000 people. 4,000 people were there, and they didn't miss it. They had an amazing moment. 
Okay? We're on, we're on the same page. So, Jesus finishes doing that, and now look at verse 11, the very next verse. Mark 8, verse 11, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Excuse me, a, a what now? You, you want a sign? Uh, hello? Right? <laughs> oh, a sign? You're, are you kidding me? What, what was all of that? Right? It just, just fed 4,000 people with some bread and fish. Okay? They are so blind. These Pharisees, they are so blind. They miss they missed it, right? They missed it. They're asking for a sign. They, they would have to be literally blind to have missed all the things that Jesus has done. And we've asked this question a lot in our Christian walk. We ask this question a lot of the Pharisees. How could the Pharisees have missed it, right? Missed Jesus, missed the Messiah. Well, they were, they were spiritually blind. The reason they could not see is because Jesus wasn't the Messiah they were expecting. And, and he wasn't doing uh, what they wanted him to do. He wasn't saying what they wanted him to say. For them, for them, if the Messiah had been real and had come, they would have, they would have expected the Messiah to come and pat them on the back. The Messiah would have affirmed them and told them, hey, you guys are doing a good job. You guys are on the right path. You guys are doing great. You're my special people. And the real Messiah would have set everything right. He would have overthrown their enemies and he would have put them back in charge. But since Jesus didn't do any of that, he didn't do the things or say the things that they expected they missed it. An event that the Jews look forward to their entire lives, the arrival of the new Moses, the arrival of the liberator, the arrival of the Messiah, the, the work of God, the hand of God, the, the word of God made flesh. They believed it, right? It, it wasn't that they weren't believers in God. They were believers and they were looking, but they missed it. Right? They missed it. But I, but I left. But I left them standing there. <laughs> Pharisees are still standing there, looking at Jesus, asking for a sign. Uh, what does Jesus say right after they ask him for a sign? Verse 12. And he sighed deeply in his spirit. Probably sounded like this. <sighs> and he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Well, there you go, right? Tell me, tell me something, does, does that, did Jesus' answer seem kind of rude to you? Oh, why, why didn't Jesus just give them a sign? Right? Just give them a sign. He did, he did miracles all the time. Why not show them something? That's what they wanted, and maybe they would have believed. Maybe they would have been on his side. Well, I don't know. You, you tell me, all right? Knowing, knowing what we know about the Pharisees, would a sign now, at this stage where they're at, would that really have worked? I mean, he just fed 4,000 people with some fish and a couple of loaves of bread. Their hearts were not in the right place, were they? I mean, their hearts were hardened. Was the problem really Jesus, that Jesus wasn't performing? Was the burden of proof really on Jesus in this moment? See, I think Jesus knew them. I think Jesus knew their hearts, and he knew that, sure, he could do a sign, but it wouldn't change their hearts. But here's the rub for me this morning, okay? Yes, 
the Pharisees missed it. And we read this story and we say, stupid Pharisee, you guys missed it. You missed Jesus, right? But we can miss it, right? We can miss it too. Jesus is right in front of us. Jesus is working all around us. Jesus is doing signs and wonders and he's working in people's lives and we are missing it. Has God stopped working? Has Jesus stopped working? Of course not. But when was the last time you saw it? When was the last time you joined God in his work? See, we, we can also miss it. Even Christians, even Christians are in danger of being spiritually blind. Let me ask you a different question. What, what should God be doing in your life? What should God be doing in your life? I mean, what do you expect God should be doing in your life? And how is that working out? Is God doing what you want? Giving you the life that you want? Showing up in your life the way you want? Or do you feel like there's moments where there's silence from God? That you've been ignored by God? It's like, Jesus, you're not doing everything I want you to do right now. And we grow a little resentful. We feel stuck. We feel sick. We feel hurt. Maybe God doesn't like me right now. See, the problem with the Pharisees wasn't Jesus, right? Instead of asking Jesus for a sign, they should have just been with Jesus, joined Jesus. They should have been with him, and then they would have seen signs every day. If we don't see what God is doing, it's because we're not paying attention. Instead of asking God to join your work, we should be joining God in his work. Instead of demanding a sign from Jesus, we should be surrendering to Jesus. We need to give up We need to give up our pain. We need to give up our doubt. And instead of continuing to ask Jesus for a sign, demanding a sign from Jesus, we need to humbly ask God what he wants. We should want Jesus more. We we should want to be in his will more. We should be inviting him in to our life more. I think we must, we have to think about it. We have to stop. I, you know what I really think we need is just some more pauses and some more breaks from the routine. We need some more introspection in our life. Because the Pharisees, they're not the only ones that miss it, right? The disciples are no better. Come on. The disciples are no better. Same chapter, same story. Just continuing on in the same chapter, a little further, verse 14. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And Jesus cautioned them, saying, Watch out! Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Did you not yet perceive or, or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes you do not see, and having ears you do not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? And how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Hey, hey, Jesus, we only have one loaf of bread in the boat. Yeah, but you know what? (laughs) You know what? What am I saying? I'm not worried. Here, can you do that? uh, Can you do that magic bread thing? Is that what they say? 
Nope. Instead, they argue that they didn't pack well for the trip. Instead of a conversation about trust, there was a conversation about blame. Who's in charge of packing this food? Oh, come on, man. Who dropped the ball? Hey, guys, we're, come on, we're better than this. Bickering back and forth. And then the one who can literally make bread out of thin air, who's in the boat with them, is listening to all of this. What do you think Jesus feels when he listens to our doubt? When he listens to our defeat? When he listens to us bickering back and forth in the boat? The disciples are blind. They missed it. They have Jesus in the boat with them and they can't see him. They're passing blame, tempers are raised, accusations are made, and who knows, maybe Jesus can't take any more of this, and he shouts, watch out! Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Hey guys, can you stop talking about bread and look at me? Thanks, all right. Watch out, please, that you don't become like them. You are dangerously close to being spiritually blind, just like the Pharisees, because the answer is right in front of you. Even after all of that, they still don't get it, and they continue to be confused. And he has to say again, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes you do not see, and having ears you do not hear, and you do not remember? I mean, let's just... Let's just role play for a moment, right? You picture yourself, you're in the boat. You're looking into the face of your creator. You're looking into the face of Jesus and he's pleading with them, trying to get them to understand. Don't you guys understand? He says, Don't, can't you hear? Can't you see? Can't you understand? Don't miss this church don't miss this the disciples have a relationship with Jesus right they walk with him they follow Jesus they talk to him every day and they still missed it from time to time so don't be hard on yourself don't be hard on yourself. We can all miss it. I can miss it. So here's what I think we need more of. We need more time to process. We need more time to stop. This last week, uh, Joanna and I, I took my sister and her son to Disney World. Tuesday, we were at Magic Kingdom. I'm pretty proud of this. I've been telling everybody. We did over 20 things. So between rides and shows and meals, we did over 20 things that day. How? We didn't stop. We did not stop. We pushed continually. When our kids got tired, we stuffed them full of sugar. We never sat down. We never took a break. Sometimes I wonder if the disciples did that too. That they ever... When did they ever stop? When did they ever stop and just talk about, hey, can we just talk about what just happened? Jesus just fed 4,000 people with some bread and some loaves. Let's, let's pause before we go on to the next place and let's, let's have a discussion about that. What does that mean for us? Take some time to process and allow some introspection to take place because they had all just witnessed a miraculous event. They have nothing to compare this event to in their life. But they didn't process it. They just experienced it. And they didn't talk about it, which subsequently means they didn't learn. They didn't learn. Learning happens when you reflect. I have sat through hundreds of college lectures. Doesn't mean I learned anything. Part of the learning process is introspection. 
Because I think if they had just talked about the fact that Jesus just fed 4,000 people as a small group, as a Bible study, then, then that problem then, when it comes up again, this problem of having no food, when that pops up, I think they would have responded very differently. We can't, we can't miss this part of the story because this part of the story is for us, right? It is possible to be near Jesus and to miss what he is doing. Yes. And I hope the knowledge of that changes you. Let, we can stop right here, right? There, there's no rules. I know we always say, oh, we have to pray at the end of the sermon. We don't have to do that. We can do whatever we want, right? If that's a good point, we should probably pray about it. Let's pray. <sighs> Jesus, life moves pretty fast. I don't want to miss you. I don't. I don't want to be the first one to finish reading my scripture verse. I don't want to be the first one to say amen. I don't want to be the first one out the door or the first one back. Life moves so fast. It's a whirlwind of getting the kids here and studying and cooking and cleaning and shopping and buying and fixing and repairing and holding and letting go. And amidst all of it, we are called to be your children. Amidst all of it, we are called to learn and to trust you. So I don't want to miss you. I don't want my day to go by and then to ask, where was Jesus? Where was God in all of that? Because if he wasn't in any of that, then what was the point? Lord, help us not to miss you. Even right now in church, a place that's so familiar, a place where it's just so easy to tune out and wait until it's all over. This is your moment. This is our moment together. I don't want to miss this. Open my eyes that I may see. Open my ears that I might hear. Amen. Let's see where we all are, okay? Because we, we asked, how long has it been? How long has it been? How long has it been since you seen God, heard God, worked alongside God? Maybe it's been a while. Maybe. In another part of the Bible, Jesus says, my father is working until now and I am working. So, if God is working and Jesus is always working, then when it's my turn to be in the boat, okay, and I'm going through the picnic basket, before I begin to worry about having no food or losing my job or being sick or the world our grandchildren have to grow up in or Am I going to be able to retire? Or I don't know what tomorrow will bring. Or loss or defeat. I need to pause. I need to pause. I need to reflect. And I need to realize that I am in the boat with the one who can make all things. I am in the boat with the one who can do all things. Last week, I was supposed to teach Bible in Vacation Bible School. This is not a picture of me teaching VBS. Uh, it was supposed to be me. I was also supposed to be in the sound booth. I was supposed to run the projector. Why? Because that's what I've always done. Those are the things I've always done for Vacation Bible School. This year I got sick and I wasn't able to. And I felt bad. I felt like I had let everybody down. I let the volunteers down. I let the kids down. I let Valerie down. I let Tara down. I let Kim down. I let the church down. When you walk through the valley, you look for something to blame. 
It has to be, has to be on me, right? Has to be us, has to be our failure. So naturally, because it fell on me, I wanted to fix it. It was an unknown, and when you're faced with an unknown, you panic. So you look for a way to fix the problem, work around the problem, something, right? Your own brain, your own strength, without pausing, without considering that maybe God is in control. God's in the boat, God's working. So I started to compose my email, right? Who, what, where, when, let's fix this. David can't be there, so we gotta figure this out. What are we gonna do? One of our staff members wrote me back. And this is what she said, word for word. Let others help you. It makes us feel good to do so. Please take it easy until you are 100%. Between all of us, we've got this. And I'm certain it'll be just fine. We can panic. There's no bread. Try to do things on our own. Panic. Pass the blame. Who's, who was in charge of packing this food? Or we can allow ourselves to be humbled and to follow our good shepherd. So this is my one chance. This is my one shot to teach a little vacation Bible school because I didn't get a chance to. So this is Howell. This is Howell. He is a desert coyote. And his memory verse for VBS this week was Psalm 147 verse 5, which says, How great is our Lord, his power is absolute. And this week, our little ones were reminded that God is in charge. We can remember that, right? When we read Psalm 147.5, we can remember that God is in charge. When we panic, when the picnic basket looks empty, how many of us need this reminder? God is in charge, right? God is in charge. Psalm 147.5. This is Miley. Miley, she is a roadrunner. Her memory verse for VBS this week was Joshua 1, 9. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I don't don't think you guys all said it out loud with me. Okay, we're gonna try it again. Joshua 1, 9. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And this week, our little ones were reminded that God is with you everywhere. When we can't see God, when we can't hear God, how many of us need that reminder? We can learn from the failure of the Pharisees. We can learn from the failure of the disciples. I don't want to make the same mistake that they are making. So I don't have three points for you. I don't have a top 10 list for you. I just have one suggestion. Reflect. Take some time to reflect. Have an inward journey. Have some introspection. If God is always moving and God is always working, then we should be more aware of that. That means amidst all of your busyness, can you build in a little stillness? At the end, at the end of your day, can you listen? Can you process the day? When you're on the back porch, before you lay down for bed, can you look back over your day and just ask God, Where were you today? Were you there? Did I miss it? Did I miss you today? Did I miss you at work? Process your day with God and listen. Did he feed 4,000 people and you missed it? Did he perform the greatest no-look three-pointer and you missed it? Did I fail to see you today? Did I fail to follow you today? Is there a person you're now in, in your life right now? They're, uh, they're a little hard to love, maybe. And you come home and you process that discussion and you think, ah, you know, you know and the next time they say that, I got, a, I got a good comeback. I got a zinger for them. Talk to God. Process your day. 
Do you want me to love them better than I am? Hopefully, the more you do this, instead of having to wait to the end of your day to process, the more you practice this, you're going to start to see God in real time. You're going to be able to recognize and see God move and speak in real time. If we go back to the story, just for a second, and actually flip one page back, if you go back to Matthew 7, Jesus heals a deaf and mute man right before the feeding of the 4,000. He heals a deaf person who can't speak. That's what he does first. And then he feeds the 4,000. And then after he feeds the 4,000, in Mark 8, 22, it says, Then they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch them. And he took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, and his sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly, and he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. What do you think? These bookends, this story, the Pharisees, the disciples, is this all a coincidence? Just happened to be the way Mark wrote this down? Nope. The point of all of this is for you to see him and hear him. It's not enough for you to just come and just sit through a 30-minute lecture. You need to process this. You need to think about this. You need to dialogue about this with a smaller group of people. You need to pray about it. You need to discuss your day with God. And, and, and Mark 8, Mark 8, what happens next? Right after Jesus gives hearing back to the deaf, right after he gives food to the hungry, right after he gives sight to the blind, Jesus went out with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others one of the prophets. And he said, but who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ. After all of it, after all of it, Jesus is looking out and he goes, hey, pop quiz. Who am I? Let's see who's paying attention. Who am I? And Peter gets it right. Jesus was not on a mission to heal or feed or to end oppression or to bring justice. That was all part of it. Definitely, that was all part of it. Jesus came to open the eyes of the blind. He wants the world to see him. And he's still on that mission. We, you and I, the church, we are on that mission. We spend our whole week out there, you know? We spend our whole week out there in the world and then we come back here to reconnect with one another, and then we start talking about our, our health. Hey, how's your health, right? Oh, I went to the doctor this week. How's your lawn, right? How's the weather? Wouldn't it be more fun? No. Wouldn't it be more right if we came back here and we shared stories? instead of talking about our lawn or our health, that we couldn't wait to get back here to share stories about what God was doing in our lives. You see, if you're looking at this, this Bible as a story from a long time ago, and that it's history, and that you should just read it and study it and read it and study it, then you miss that too. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. The Old Testament is chapter 1. The New Testament is chapter 2. You are chapter 3. You're chapter 3. This story is your story. These characters, they're not myth. They're not legend. They were flesh and blood like you. They have the same hang-ups, the same fears as you. And the same great stories, they can be your great stories. Don't miss it. 
Don't settle for the stories that other people are telling. Seek the Lord. Open your eyes to the work that he is doing all around you and join him there. Begin. Begin to write your own thrilling chapter. Don't miss it. Let's pray again. Father God, what a wonderful time to be together, to have this opportunity to break open your word and to discuss your son on no, on no day do we want to miss it. There is no day we want to pass us by and to miss the work that you are doing, the love you are giving, the grace you are issuing, Lord. We don't want to miss it. Thank you for your son and for his love. When I leave this place and when I go out into the world, I not only want to see your hands and feet, I want to be them. And I never want to miss an opportunity. Amen. Hey, we're so glad uh, that you joined us today. So glad that you're hanging out with us and always want to encourage you, remind you that we are here. We are here every Sunday, 9.30 and 11. 9.30 is our traditional service. We have a choir. We're going to sing all of your favorite hymns. And at 11 o'clock, we have a more contemporary service. You can come relaxed, come as you are. It's also the uh, service where we have a full children's program from nursery all the way through high school. And we have high school and junior high meeting uh, all, all uh, summer long, all summer long. And so if you want to get to know what our youth is doing, you can always uh, find us at waldenchurch.com and then click uh, on the youth, reach out to our leaders and see what our summer schedule is. The kids are going to the lake. They're having a ton of fun. They're going to summer camp. We just finished vacation Bible school. Uh, yeah, we're a church that keeps going through the summer. We keep going through the summer. We don't stop. Because, uh, because we don't stop loving you. We don't stop loving you guys. We don't stop loving God. I love you guys. I will see you next Sunday. Bye.